On July the 6th, a ceremony was held in Beijing to mark the 70th anniversary of what's known as the ice-breaking mission by a group of British business people to China. In July 1953, Jack Perry led 15 representatives from British companies on the first ever such trip by a major Western country to New China after it was founded in 1949. It was almost two decades before diplomatic relations were established between the two countries. The delegation signed deals worth 30 million pounds with China. In the following year, a trade mission of 48 British businessmen led by Jack Perry visited China again. The cohort was the precursor of the 48 Group, which was renamed the 48 Group Club in 1991. What lasting impact did the ice-breaking mission have? What's the current temperature of the waters surrounding China-UK relations. Do we need more such missions? I'm pleased to be joined from London by Jack Perry's son Stephen Perry, who now is chairman of the 48 Group Club. Mr. Perry, thank you very much and welcome to The Point. Now, the 1953 visit really thawed the West trade embargo with China and members of the delegation were later called icebreakers, as I said. Looking back, what were they hoping to achieve and uh, what were the main obstacles in your memory? I, I think when my father was first asked to try and help reopen the trade with Europe, with the UK, through the UK, um, he, he was aware of the tensions that existed then between China and the West and uh, that it would take some uh, effort and some bravery uh, to break through. Uh, he was very happy to do this because it was his interest in life uh, to help uh, move the world forward and not stay the way it was, to find solutions rather than problems. Um, and he pulled together a mission with the help of friends uh, that was across the political spectrum, mainly of people who wanted to do business with China, some of whom had previously done business indirectly with China through Hong Kong. And uh, they, were, they, they, they took seven days to get from London to Hong Kong, which tells you something about the state of the world's transportation at that stage. And um, it took him three days to get from Hong Kong to Beijing. Uh, China was in a, a terrible state. It had uh, survived wars from the early 19th century right through to the anti-Japanese war and the civil war. Most of the communications in China were broken. The people were largely starving. Uh, famine and epidemics were evident everywhere. When he first got on the boat to go ahead to Beijing with his friend and uh, in invite invitor, Dr. Chi Chao Ting, he saw hundreds of people crammed onto a ferry and many were starving and some had lost limbs. Uh, he cried. He could not believe that such conditions existed for the people. As he went through China up to Beijing, he was amazed at the people who were working to try and rebuild the holes in the road, the railway system, the telephone system and so on. And everywhere he met the cadres of the party, and everywhere the, the cadres of the party were working alongside the people to rebuild China. He was impressed very much by the commitment of the party to working with the people. They were not sitting on chairs at the side. They were not indulging themselves. Hmm. They were fully part of the uh, work to rebuild China. I, I wanted to ask you, um, how emotional is this subject to you? Because from the introduction, we can tell that not only he continued to dedicate himself to the same cause, but he also involved his family, involved you. You kind of took over, right, his cause. So what was yes. the emotional bond? How did he first describe to you his passion, his trip to China, and his passion to move the world forward in a positive way. He was a tough man, my father. He came from a poor part of London. He had to leave school at 14 because his family was bankrupt and he had to work, um, even though he had a scholarship for a top state school at that time. He educated himself. He understood different uh, developments that were occurring in the world, particularly 
after the end of the Second World War, uh, he was very, very um, committed to the progressive movement. And that was part of the motivation to get things to change. Uh, I, I think he gave me the sense of being able to objectively understand China without being involved with um, prejudices or biases. He saw China as it was. He saw China as it had become. And he passed that on to us. In um, He was not an emotional man. He was a very analytical man, self-educated man, as I said. Uh, but when we saw him cry from his memories of what he saw, it had a very deep impression on us four and a half children, as he had then. There was another one on the way. He, he, was, uh, he was moved to tears by what he saw in China, and that moved us. And it, it influenced me. And when I saw pictures later in my life as a student of the Vietnam War, I had a sense of what he had seen and what he felt. Well, this is extraordinary because of the blockade the West had of China that was uh, under Communist uh, Party rule, and still it is. Yes. How extraordinary. Uh, when w did you first realize that what you got from your father, what you took as natural, as uh, for granted, that, of course, your father would be telling you uh, what is really happening in the world, and found that contradicted by what you were told probably in the media and society? How was it like... Uh, for, for you when you were growing up? Uh, I, I guess I, I had something of the same journey that he had. I learned to make up my own mind, to establish my own facts. And I was very much influenced by what I saw happening in South Africa and Vietnam. It told me that there were still deep problems, deep pain in the world. And uh, you could be on the side of ignoring it and looking after your own career, or you could uh, in, find a way to bring it into your own life's work. And eventually I did that. My father uh, asked me after several years of part-time work to, to join him and to uh, help relieve the pressure. So we, we've seen a lot of experiences inside China and outside China. But the animosity towards China in 1952-53 was, was very intense. And uh, my father uh, had a lot of problems with people uh, calling him all sorts of names. But he, he said, um, I, I think you'll realize that China is a peaceful country um, and that uh, you will find a way to enjoy it and appreciate it. We are now back in some of those conditions that he experienced. Well, later in his life, um, how did he feel looking back? How did he feel about the icebreaking trip he made? Were he able to say, look, I insisted I went through all of these pressure and I was right. I did the right thing. Was he able to do that to himself? Oh, yes. I, I mean, if you have a chance to read his book, which is we didn't publish, um, you know, significantly uh, because we're not that kind of people. But you, you will see he was proud of what he did. It, it, it meant uh, it was an opportunity for him to do something for other people, uh, not only the, the Chinese, but also for many business people who found a way to uh, go to China and to do business with China. He was very pleased to perform that role. He understood the significance of its international ramifications, but he felt it was the right thing to do. And I think he was right. I, I, I support what he did, and I've tried to carry on the work. What do you think is the legacy of the ice-breaking mission that is uh, uh, still ringing true with, uh, with China, with the Chinese leadership? Um, President Xi Jinping sent a letter of congratulation to the ceremony marking the 70th anniversary. I mean, that is probably the highest recognition you can get from China for the kind of work that's done. So what would you, how would you describe the legacy of that ice-breaking mission? Um, the legacy of the icebreaking mission is that we are here again, still 70 years later, uh, involved in some of the same contradictions and complications in the world. And we're able to say, we did it once, we'll try and do it again. Uh, there are many more people involved this time in trying to deal with these complications. It was a fairly lonely time for my father then. Uh, but I, I think the legacy is that icebreaking is probably a constant need. It goes up and down in terms of intensity. If we went back uh, 10, 15 years, uh, things were pretty good, but now things are not very good. Uh, what has changed? Um, I, I can go into that if you, if you want, or, or we can wait till later in the interview. Up to you. 
Uh, well, we can go into that. I mean, what have changed? Uh, what have not changed? For instance, you said constantly there needs to be icebreaking, meaning to bring the two people together or to foster understanding among the people. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Well, the first job that I was involved in on when I joined full time was to do the first major deals between America and China when Nixon and Kissinger were going to China. And uh, China asked us to find um, quite a significant amount of commodities to ship, to sell to China and ship to China because China was making sure that America knew that China was for real and uh, wanted to welcome uh, Chinese goods into the American market. So I started uh, in the same situation that my father had been involved in. At that time, America was very open to China. It had to exit from Vietnam. It had to do that in a way that uh, made them feel safe about Asia. They were having the same concern then about the domino theory, which is again now uh, prevalent. Uh, and I was able to understand the, the trends that were involved then, trends that were involved in 1952, and trends that are involved now in uh, 2023. The, the, the process of change in the world situation is not a straight line. And there are all sorts of reactions. Um, and uh, we're seeing some of them now. I've been speaking to Stephen Perry about his father's ice-breaking mission 70 years ago. Stay with us. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. <laughs> Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin and this is The Point. Well, last November, um, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak made a statement declaring the end of the golden era and uh, advocated for a fresh approach by the UK to China. However, in recent months, we also witnessed a shift in his stance, at least we perceive, um, as he attempts to mend relations, it seems that um, he has dispatched the trade minister to Hong Kong. It's anticipated that UK, UK foreign, tr uh, foreign secretary may soon visit China. So uh, what's the temperature of the waters now? What is your assessment? Well, the, the golden era led to a reaction from the United States towards uh, the UK getting too close to China. And we were put under pressure from the United States to join uh, their attempt to um, uh, contain the rise of China. Uh, maybe I use that phrase because it, it sums it up without any emotional words. It was the containment of China. China. Uh, the, the United States has become more intense in its containment of China, and it has asked the UK to be more intense. The UK gave up its empire in the 1930s to the United States peacefully uh, because, I, I'm sure, we felt that if we didn't, we would have it taken from us. So our approach is to try and maintain peace and uh, stability rather than conflict. Um, and uh, in the last uh, few years, we've had a, a lot of pressure to um, contain, to participate in the containment of China, to exclude Huawei from our telecom system and so on. What we find now is that um, Mr. Sunak is, uh, we, we, we say, from the center of the political spectrum and can recognize the importance of the opportunities from China of investment and trade 
China is uh, almost 5% uh, growth. It's 30% of world growth. Uh, there is nowhere in the world that can produce that, except uh, India is having a, a temporary or maybe long-term uh, em emergence as a, as, a, as a major source of not just investment, but trade. But the, the situation is that um, the United States is trying to decide how to handle its position in the world. And during that period, it's asking the UK to be um, uh, forceful in its approach to China. Mr. Sunak has to find the balance between the right wing of his party, who are rather emotional about China, rather, in my opinion, unrealistic about China, um, and um, other people in the business community who see the opportunity for improving the UK situation domestically by increasing trade and investment with China. Uh, there is no doubt that there is um, nowhere else in the world that can provide the UK with the support that it needs through trade and investment more than China. Um, even, even the United States cannot take the place of China. So yes, the golden era may be um, put into hibernation while we go through this difficult period. But I would say that because of China's patience in dealing with the UK, because it has not responded to some provocations of quite a considerable nature, uh, that the relations between the two countries are still um, uh, stable, if not um, uh, in, in the right condition. So uh, all I can say to you is, as a Chinese citizen, when you hear and watch the UK, please understand we're going through some pain and some change. And some things may come across as not very nice, but they are just the things that happen uh, when a country is having some difficulties uh, and we're having some difficulties. Thank understood, you. Understood, understood. I'm, I'm sure um, that the, how shall I say, the uh, patience or the steady attitude of the Chinese government towards UK, towards Europe in general, I think is a reflection of the belief that uh, you know, uh, it's a difficult period of time for many countries to also adjust the new dy dynamics in international relations. Um, a small point here, though, but I do want to highlight that because the U.S. says it does not want to contain China. That they have a denial towards, you know, that strategy you, you described. But why do you think it is a containment strategy that the, or, or containment that the U.S. Is, is trying to mount against China? Um, it, it's not a very nice label to put on uh, a country or a person in their relationships, uh, but it, it, it is what's happening. It, it is what's happened for uh, decades. That um, because of some misreading of Marx and Engels, uh, some people have taken the view in capitalism that if they don't fight against uh, the socialists, uh, that they that, that they will lose their position. And I don't think that's right. I don't think that China has any ambition to overcome and rule any of our countries. I think it's uh, mostly concerned with its own country and developing its own modernization and rejuvenation. Uh, and and uh, But uh, I think for foreign countries, particularly the very powerful United States, uh, it is experiencing China as something that is growing too fast and soon may become the biggest economy in the world. And that, uh, that I, I've spent many years doing business in America. And I know what it means America, to Americans to be number one. America does not want to be number two. And um, so you, you, they're fighting that process. Uh, they're fighting it by proper means and not proper means. Uh, they, there are no rules to this competition. It's not a football match or a cricket match. Um, it, it is uh, quite a crude uh, situation out there. And sometimes um, there are measures used by the United States in this process, like towards chips and uh, towards Huawei, which uh, some may think are, are not appropriate. But that happens when, once you get into this battle for being number one. The, the biggest mistake the Americans make about the situation, and I like uh, Americans, I have a lot of friends in America, and I've enjoyed being and living in America. But the biggest mistake they make is to think that what they set out to do is also China's mission. What the United States set out to do was to become number one in the world. They took over from the UK. They left Germany and Japan uh, aside. Um, and they think that uh, China could only be trying to be number one. 
I think because of what my father saw and made us feel about China, he can see that China is going to long be uh, focused on being in a place called enough. It's a long way from there yet. It's still in a long period of transition that started in 1949, was restated in 1978, is again restated in 2012 and 2017, and it will take uh, many decades to get to where China wants to be as a nation. I do not think that President Xi Jinping gets up in the morning and thinks, how can I rule the world? He probably thinks about how can I have enough food for the people, enough education, enough homes. Uh, and I'm sure um, in my short meetings with him, he gave me that impression that his uh, work is regard, it regards China does not regard the world. It may, it may include uh, neighbors and Asia to help them become peaceful and stable and to do more trade and investment with each other. Um, and it may include to be in investing and trading with Europe, Africa and uh, South America. But I don't think we see any troops outside China. We don't see any missiles pointed outside China. Um, the Chinese uh, government is not for hegemony. That's something I'm sure of, and I ask myself often that question, um, but the United States sees it as being like the United States. Oni soit quoi qui mal pense is the, is the phrase that comes to mind from France. What about Hong Kong? Because Hong Kong is, uh, has been a thorny issue between uh, UK's relationship or for the UK when it deals with China, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, in terms of trade, Hong Kong is also extremely important. Um, the uh, trade via Hong Kong, or investment via Hong Kong to the UK actually grew by 15% for the year 2022. So uh, do you see Hong Kong um, slowly being less of a point of difference between the two sides that Hong Kong can continue to play a vital role in business and trade relations between the two sides? I think the British and Chinese did a, a great job of finding a basis for the return of Hong Kong to China. Uh, some people tried to cause trouble uh, at the time and in the lead up to that uh, 1997 date, uh, but uh, China has been committed to uh, one country, two systems and uh, I think was shocked by the behavior of some people in, 19, in 2019, 2020, and has had to take steps to um, take leadership over uh, Hong Kong and work with the leaders of Hong Kong to stabilize Hong Kong and rebuild it uh, in a new fashion uh, as part of the Greater Bay Area. Some people uh, in our country have found that hard to accept they uh, have a problem which leads to uh, some racism in our streets towards uh, people of Asian background. It's very regrettable. Um, but they do not know. These people who oppose it do not have the full sense of history and transition. Hong Kong cannot be independent, and that is what they wanted. They wanted to encourage Hong Kong to be independent, and that caused some problems. Now, I think um, we're moving into a quieter period uh, with foreign secretaries who are less inclined towards the right wing of the Tory party and to trying to find more stability. Uh, but it also depends on forces from outside the UK as to what happens in the world. I think the people of Hong Kong know that if they want better residential accommodation, better jobs and better social welfare, they're going to get it from uh, China. And China is already taking steps in those directions. Uh, we can look on it and we can say, as many British people do, that it's a pity that we didn't do more whilst we were the colonial uh, rulers of Hong Kong. But we didn't. And we cannot change history. All we can do is to try and encourage and help Hong Kong to stabilize as an active member of the Greater Bay Area. I think uh, more and more the British people will move to that understanding. Uh, the, the, the right wing of the Tory party are not bad people, uh, but they just have a grasp of an issue that they received from outside the UK and think that they will get support uh, for that approach. But uh, as we're finding now, um, Hong Kong is just settling down. 
Moving back to the ice-breaking mission, uh, are you passing it on to possibly a third, another generation? I mean, is there anybody to take it over from you when you retire, yes. if, if you do one day? Um, yeah, uh, uh, but my, my father retired, I will retire, uh, but I won't stop uh, my interest in China and writing about China. Um, I brought with me my uh, eldest son, um, who has worked with China for a number of years, and he's had some difficulties um, arising from that in this current era. But he's brave and he's strong, and he came with me and uh, took some risks to come with me, and uh, he was delighted to be here in China with all of you and uh, to see again the country that he has so much respect for, and he, and he will take my place. But do you think in general the younger generation nowadays in the UK um, have greater open-mindedness, have better understanding about, uh, about the realities, about the, the true China than back in 1950s? Uh, to, to some extent, the cat is out of the bag, as we say in English. The, 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 the people in the UK know we now live in the world. We cannot look down our noses at people who were in the past uh, colonials colonies of ours, uh, we have to be um, in a world in which we feel equals, not superior. Um, that's taken a long time for us to um, adjust to. The, the problem now is that in this uh, uh, challenge from the United States towards China, which, which I'm sure has long been expected uh, by the leadership of the party, uh, that um, we have to uh, recognize that there is now a great deal of propaganda happening in both directions. And we have to be able to see through propaganda and understand it. The young people in Britain are mainly interested in having better lives for the British people. They're not uh, globalists, they're not world, uh, world, world, world people in that sense, uh, but they enjoy traveling enormously. And I'm quite sure that young people in uh, Britain want to travel across the world, across the Silk Roads, um, to see China and to experience China. Um, and uh, things are improving. It's, it's not back to the way it was. Um, what Sunak said was perhaps the golden era was a, was a little bit uh, sooner than everybody was ready because we didn't know that the United States was planning. What they called initially a tilt to Asia is now a full um, imbalance towards Asia. But I think that the young people in Britain have seen that Brexit was a mistake, mm. that we are part of Europe, okay. and uh, they're seeing that the hostility towards China is also probably a mistake. We have to be secure. We have to have defense. Yeah. We don't need to be paranoid. Yeah, we need uh, more people to people exchanges so that people come we and do. see both sides, both ways. Thank yeah. you very much. We have to leave it there. Stephen Perry, chairman of the 48 uh, Group Club, joining me from London. With that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got The Point.